Why don't you use any lights? I like source. Y you do why? Because it delivers reality. Uh oh. Today, we're going to deviate from our typical audio format of the Northern Overexposure podcast to bring you the first in a series of video essays on the television series Northern Exposure. We'd like to explore specific episodes of the series and really get into the nuts and bolts, the in and outs of specific visual moments and ideas. To begin, we're taking a deep dive into Season 1, Episode 3, Soapy Sanderson, and examining the theme of sides, as well as our perception of the present and future. We'll be looking at the characteristic cinematography of Northern Exposure, as well as its careful dialogue. Every single one of us possesses multiple yous. There's the you that you are with your friends, the you that you are with your coworkers, the you that you are with your parents, even the you of the past, present, and future. We're all multifaceted human beings with layers in different aspects that are all integrated to define who we really are. In the beginning of Northern Exposure, all we really know about Joel is that he's a Jewish doctor from New York. The same holds for the rest of the townsfolk. We don't know much about them at this point, other than the surface level details and the one side they've shown to us. But the Soapy Sanderson episode acknowledges the depths and facets of Northern Exposure's characters. Let's start off with the titular character, Soapy. When he's introduced, he's framed in an enclosure with his dogs. The framing of Soapy behind a cage, right off the bat, can be interpreted visually as Soapy being trapped, confined in his old age and present situation. The thought of the future discomforts him. He even disregards advice from Dr. Fleischman in the following scene because he doesn't want to accept the fact that he is an aging man. He's stuck in a certain mindset, and the framing with the dog kennel cage in the foreground helps to visualize this idea. Now, you might be thinking, Charles, you're looking way too deep into this. There's literally no way to shoot this scene without Soapy standing inside the cage. And I would say you're completely right. Symbolism and subtext and their interpretations are going to vary with each audience. And perhaps we're looking too hard where we try to find meaning in every aspect of a piece of art. In his book, Making Movies, film director Sidney Lumet recounts a conversation with another master filmmaker. I once asked Akira Kurosawa why he had chosen to frame a shot in Ron in a particular way. His answer was that if he'd panned the camera one inch to the left, the Sony factory would be sitting there exposed, and if he'd panned an inch to the right, we would see the airport, neither of which belonged in a period movie. Only the person who's made the movie knows what goes into the decisions that result in any piece of work. But to us at the Northern Overexposure podcast, we feel that the creative forces behind Northern Exposure are inviting us to interpret the show with figurative meaning. But even if they didn't intend for there to be any symbolic resonance here, it's irrelevant because the show doesn't belong solely to them. It exists as a benefit to all of us. If we can have a richer experience interpreting something, then that's still, as a whole, a net benefit. Extrapolating deeper meaning is, of course, our mission statement. And while we don't want to go overboard and assign meaning to something that's innocuous or inaccurately twist the words of the creators, we want to enrich both our experience and our listeners' experience by trying to put to words what the creators are showing rather than telling. Now, returning back to Soapy, we can see in this episode that the townsfolk of Sicily didn't really know much about him. Joel never realized he was an esteemed professor at Kenyon College, and Maggie never realized he had a wife. There are sides to him that they never saw, and the choice of his coverage in Joel's office is indicative of that. Soapy is purposefully shot in profile. Very clearly, we can only see one side of him. Additionally, the cinematic lighting characteristic to Northern Exposure works conveniently within this theme of sides, as we can see Soapy is largely cast in the shadows in this scene, creating the appearance of two sides to him, light and dark, public and hidden. Soapy is described as an enigmatic figure that has a love of two distinct halves. He loved country music for its simple portrayal of hero and villain. He loved the black and white of life. And to add to this, when Shelley is later interviewed by a student documentary crew, she reveals that Soapy had a love of one-eyed jacks. That's a piece of toast with a hole in the middle and an egg underneath so the yolk sticks through the hole. This one-eyed jack antidote evokes the image of a man in profile, again, underlying the motif of only seeing one side. It can be said that most of Soapy's other side isn't revealed until he goes to the other side. The use of video and the natural light that the student documentarians favor plays a key role in expressing this theme of sides. The video camera figuratively and literally portrays its subjects in black and white. The subjects are often more vulnerable and exposed when the camera is on them. 
No more is that evident than in this scene when Maggie learns from the documentary crew that she reminded Soapy of his late wife. The choice in this scene to cover Maggie only in black and white video, whereas the rest of the scene is shot in color film, emphasizes Maggie's emotional shakiness and uncertainty as she tries to process this new information about Soapy. The handheld video camera is literally shaking, suggesting Maggie is shaken by the realization that she reminded Soapy of his late wife. Though Soapy saw in Maggie visual similarities to his late wife, he found her bolder in personality, but more cautious with her relationships. This comparison recontextualizes the character of Maggie, a bush pilot that is constantly aware of her effect on men. Maggie. Yeah? Tell us about the real Alaska. Excuse me? What did you come here hoping to find? The documentarians imply that there is a real Alaska to be found, a hidden universe tucked away in this corner of the world, away from prying eyes. This idea of a true Alaska is brought up again later in the episode, when the documentary crew is interviewing Holling. Holling tells the camera that Soapy believed that Alaska was a state of mind. Maurice quickly counters with his belief that Alaska isn't just a place you go to run away from the world. Alaska is the world. It is just like everywhere else. It has warm and cold weather resorts, it has camping, boating, ice fishing, restaurants, everything that everywhere else has. And while Maurice isn't wrong per se, we can see Ed subconsciously disagreeing with him as his camera drifts away from Maurice's beliefs and focuses on the collection of items decorating the brick. Visual props that suggest a classical, more rugged, and romantic view of Alaska. Ed and the student documentary crew are fascinated by the unique atmosphere of Alaska, as we can see when the director of the documentary is preoccupied with the simplicity of the dirt on the ground. Even the natives of Alaska and the land itself are shown to have alternating sides. The financially savvy tribesmen, being something you might not quite expect, wish to purchase the land that Soapy bequeathed to Joel and Maggie. They claim that the land could be used for mining minerals and natural gases, but their true purpose is to use the land as a tax shelter, a front for them to write off as an unprofitable business venture. The land, valued as worthless, according to the tribesmen, is angled to become a complex piece of real estate, with many layers hidden beneath the concrete that will be poured upon it. I mentioned earlier about the cinematic lighting in the scene with Soapy and Joel's office. And we can see again a similar visual motif of sides returning during Joel and Maggie's dinner scene, this time expressed through the colors of light as well as the framing. After a commercial break, we see Maggie and Joel framed in tight close-ups. Maggie's coverage is very soft with a shallow depth of field focus, and the firelight is washing over the frame to bathe everything in warm light. Joel is similarly colored warm, though there is a kiss of moonlight on his cheek here. The similar but separate lighting schemes of the two characters suggests a warm and intimate conversation. Maggie is perhaps under the influence of the bottle of Lafitte Rothschild 1975, and Joel is partly there with her, but he knows there's a side of himself that he's not showing to Maggie. If only he knew how to express himself. Even though there's this, there's this other side to me, right? This, this side that you like? There's, this, there's a lot in the middle, too. What do you mean? I mean that, well, um, person's only human. As the scene continues and the spell of intimacy is broken, the coverage pulls out to wider shots to reflect this separation. We can see again the theme of the two not fully seeing each other as a whole in this broad daylight scene where everything that was hidden is now revealed. Maggie exclaims that her problem with Joel is not his lying or cheating, but his whole everything. Joel dismisses Maggie as Mother Teresa and refutes any claims that he is Marcus Welby, a fictional doctor. And later, he refers to Maggie as Polly Purebred, a fictional character from the series Underdog, which, coincidentally, features a dog who has an alter ego. This all conveys the idea that they are not caricatures or one-dimensional characters. Maggie ends the scene by saying, Soapy was wrong. But you can see that she means that Soapy was wrong about her as well choosing to believe that Soapy could not possibly have predicted this other side of Maggie. Really quickly, I also wanted to point out Maggie's costuming throughout the episode. At the start of the episode, she's wearing blue, and partway through, the color shifts to orange before finally landing on the color red for the remainder of the episode, the portions of the episode where she is most emotional, the most on fire, figuratively speaking. To contrast, Joel begins this episode wearing red, before switching to more earthy colors and finally settling into blue during the climactic scene between him and Maggie. 
We've already discussed this scene in our podcast episode on Soapy Sanderson, but revisiting it here, we can indicate all the visual language at work. Here in this scene, they agree to meet halfway, both visually and figuratively agreeing to a compromise. What's amazing about this sequence is its use of blocking, or choreography of the actors. The two characters start very far apart, only to move in closer and closer. The framing becomes tighter, and Joel even crosses Maggie, visually changing the direction of their eye lines to each other, and textually changing the meaning of the scene. Now, Joel is seated, submitting to Maggie and attempting to make an apology. He crosses again as the subject changes, and we're even tighter. The characters are talking about intimacy, what happened last night. And we can see clearly in a clever reveal that what appeared to be Maggie, exhausted and sweating from chopping wood in the wide shot, was just a mask to cover the fact that all along, Maggie had been crying, which we can see now in her eyes in close-up. The here and now with the there and then. Let's connect the theme of sides with what the present and future hold for our characters. The fledgling young Ed at the moment is eccentric, goofy, and naive, purposeless and drifting, Ed is the aimless arrow of the town, the one the folks in Sicily call on when they need a hand to help, a chauffeur to drive. But in this episode, Ed realizes that there is a direction for his compass to follow, stories. And the way Ed is going to tell these stories is through the medium of film. The seed of his inspiration sprouts in the scene where Maggie confronts Joel while he is being videoed, a moment where both art and reality are interwoven into indistinguishable branches. It is this moment that sets off the metaphorical butterfly of Ed's decision to pursue his future as a filmmaker. Ed reinvents himself with a new identity, calling himself the Bergman of the North, and states, I don't think I'm ever going to look at life the same after this. Though Ed is reborn this episode, and we'll see him forever in this new light, it's not like Ed loses the other parts of himself as well. He still performs chores for the other townsfolk, He's still oblivious to social cues. He's still Ed. It's just that the passage of time has a funny way of altering parts of us in its endless march.